Hi everyone, welcome back to Rose Stops Buying Stuff. I completely forgot to film my intro before I just kind of went into getting ready and talking about things, so I am filming it at the end. I'm going to look nothing like this in the next clip. Um, but yeah, enjoy. Hey everyone, so I hope you're all as well as any of us can be in the current time. I am going to have a chat with you today and I was going to get ready and then have a chat and then I thought, I don't know how much of a chat or how much of a worthwhile chat this chat is going to be. So I thought, well, I'll just film it whilst I'm getting ready so that even if I talk gibberish at you, you've got the content of um, the products and that might be vaguely interesting even if what I am saying is not. Get my hair back. This headband is from Zara in case anyone's interested. Obviously it's not new but don't know you might find it somewhere until Zara gets forced to shut. I'm also wearing a Star Wars spirit jersey which is potentially the most unflattering item in my wardrobe but I love it very dearly so it was not in my actual wardrobe but my actual wardrobe has gone a little bit out the window at weekends generally. Let's just get on into it. First thing I'm going to apply, I want to do this kind of really statement deep dark lip and I want to kind of knock all the redness out of my complexion to support that so the first thing I'm doing is using the Dr. Jart Cisoplast or Cisapair sorry Tiger Grass Colour Correcting Treatment. I bought this on not a whim because I bought this when I'd already started my beauty no buy but I had finished my green colour corrector so I was looking for a green colour corrector and I had been going to just replace the MAC one that I had finished with the same one because I was perfectly happy with it but I came across a set, uh, I was in TK Maxx with my friend Lauren and there was a set that had this which is like the little mini jar and the full size jar and a little mini of the tiger grass serum for like something ridiculous like 10 or 12 pounds like so much less than it was worth and we just thought it was a great deal and we both got it i hadn't really realized this is kind of a base on its own rather than just being a green color corrected it kind of adjusts to a sort of skin tone that is a little bit too dark for me I don't know if it'll kind of look too dark on camera but I wouldn't walk about with it on. If I had done a bit more research into this product rather than kind of being like oh I actually can buy this because I need to replace it and this is a good deal and just kind of run into it. This might not have been something I bought but I bought it and now I need to use it up so I am actually very nearly finished. This if you guys can see there's not a lot in that jar but as I said the set also had the full size jar so I'll be using it for a little while. If any of you guys do use this, do you use it before or after primer? Because I'm using it as a colour corrector so it's kind of a base product, then maybe I should still use primer first. I don't know, I've been kind of using it as the last step in my skincare, then going into my makeup which includes, well starts with primer. Let me know if you use this, what do you, pre or post primer, what's your, your choice? Primer wise I am using the NARS Smooth and Protect Primer, with this has SPF 50, that um, Dr. Jart stuff I've put in my face has SPF 15 so you know I'll be SPF'd up if nothing else. Kind of put most of this in the centre of my face and then work it out because I am the most pory in the centre of my face so that's where I want the most smoothing going on but that's why I wouldn't use this although it's got the SPF 50 in it which is nice to have that extra um, you know wouldn't replace uh, my SPF from my skincare in terms of like the one I take down my neck and things but uh, it's nice to have coronavirus guys COVID-19 how are we all feeling more specifically I suppose what I really want to know so many of you have reached out to me since Oh, I didn't even say welcome back to Rose Stops Buying Stuff in my intro. I don't know if I actually said this is the Maybelline Instant Anti-Age, the Eraser Eye Eye Treatment and Concealer, but this is in the shade, it's in the Correctory shade. It's it's kind of rubbed off, so I don't know what the name of the shade is, but it's the, the pinky corrector shade rather than a concealer shade. So anyway, what was I saying? Yeah, loads of you have reached out to me since I rebranded and started making the focus of my channel. The story of my no buy journey and said you know I really identify with what you're doing I'm kind of fed up with 
you know, the sort of consumerist nation that we've all kind of become when we weren't looking and feeling beholden to items and stuff like that. So how is this making you feel about spending? For me, I couldn't find a way to struggle less with spending addiction than I'm feeling right now. That was a really weird way to phrase that. What I mean is that I feel like this is such an enormous global pandemic that the very concept of shopping and being bothered about shopping and being able to shop and being able to own things like in the way that my mind has obsessed in the past over the pursuit of a pair of shoes or whatever seems so trivial and shallow right now i suppose it's a little bit like it's very common for astronauts to get depressed after they come back to earth when they've been in space and seen just how small the earth is in the concept of space that the idea of them coming down and trying to lead a life on that earth and for that life to feel like it has any significance is just it's difficult for them to comprehend that's kind of how I feel is that I was living this life where I was so concerned with with things and with the pursuit of things and with the owning of things and with the status that I thought I was getting through being the owner of these things and the help that I thought that I was giving myself which obviously I wasn't really giving myself I was actually I was self-soothing through material possessions because I didn't want to give myself the real help by tackling the real issues um, and I'm very aware of that I don't know if I've made that clear because somebody left a comment on my last video I am going to reply to all my comments by the way I've just not had a chance to sit down at the computer and I read them I do really appreciate them because I get them in my phone and notifications. I actually appreciate them so much that I don't want to reply to them on the go with like a flippant message that I've typed on my phone. I really feel like that's not good enough of a reply to the really such lovely thoughtful comments that people have sent me. I feel like you're due more of a reply than that. And that's why sometimes it actually takes me longer to get back to you because to actually give you the reply that I feel that you're worth and that your comment is worth and that the, the effect that that comment has had in my life, as dramatic as this might sound, the energy that that is worth in spending the time to reply to is not something that I can achieve on the go, on my phone, on my way to work or whatever. Like, So I am going to reply to all your comments and I hugely appreciate them, but that's why it sometimes takes me ages to reply. It's just because I want to be in a headspace where I can sit at the computer and my sole focus is replying to these wonderful, thoughtful, helpful comments. But what my point was going to be there, somebody left me a comment and was like, it's the same as, because I was talking about how I was abusing food last month, which lol, I'm so abusing food this month, in a way that seems the way that I was abusing food last month, makes that look like I was not abusing food, but also like, the thing is I have no desire to shop but I'm obviously still self-soothing through this panic but I'm definitely doing it with food. But somebody had left me a comment saying like all of these are just you need to figure out what it is that's underneath them and I I know that. That's the thing. I, I have some idea of what's underneath it and actually right let, let me get my phone to like make sure I say this correctly. Maslow's um, pir pyramid of needs. I don't know why I'm sticking my hand up. I, it's, um, I speak with my hands. So it's Maslow's pyramid of needs. I'm sure you're all familiar. I think everybody is kind of familiar but I wanted to make sure I was reading out the exact right kind of terms for each of them. Bottom, the basic thing that we need, food, water, warmth and rest. Shelter and fuel basically are your basic needs. The next one from that is your safety needs. So security and safety. This is this is where I think this is all really interesting. So let's move up through the pyramid actually. There then your belongingness and love needs which is your intimate relationships and friends, your esteem needs which is your prestige and feeling of accomplishment and then once you've got that, you've got your self-actualization at the very top of the pyramid, which is achieving one's full potential, including creative activities. Now, this I think is so interesting for me, and in that I think the main thing that causes this feeling of like emptiness in me that I try and fill and get rid of with the fleeting 
momentary pleasures of shopping and this is I think it's not completely different but when I was shopping when I was very depressed it was a high for me and it was very much at the moment that the thing became mine it was the moment I handed money over for it, it was this little like I was just in this horrible place nothing made me happy the only thing that and it didn't make me happy but the only thing that gave me this fleeting moment of joy was buying stuff and that was how it spiralled because it was the only thing I could do that made me actually made me actually feel that it was worthwhile being alive because it was the only thing that that gave me any spark of joy I just I couldn't comprehend like I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning I didn't want to function I didn't want to be alive I was never actively suicidal at that point but I would just go to bed and basically be like if there is a god and they're listening like please don't let me wake up I don't want to wake up that was where I was at and um shopping was the only thing that was remotely making any kind of impact in that landscape of feeling like that oh god I get quite emotional like vocalizing that even though I, I don't feel like that anymore I really don't I haven't for a very long time so I'm very grateful not to feel like that but I don't know why I get quite emotional there explaining that that's how I felt so when I was shopping it was this like little high that it was the only bit that made me feel happy that was how that spiraled when I was shopping in that very dangerous addicted way but the root of that was depression where I'm at now and I think this is the thing is that I think even until recently I have been convinced that I had this habit of shopping reg I'm doing such a great job of getting ready while I talk haven't I yeah great plan but I had such a habit of shopping anyway that I was convinced that that was how the shopping had been able to become so problematic because the routine was already there so the routine just ramped up and I wasn't I think maybe considering that now I don't feel like that but when I shop it's not an addiction the way it was in that it's the only moment where I feel good and I'm going back at higher and higher frequency to achieve that feeling the way that it was when I was problematically shopping as a way of trying to cure my own depression by thinking I could shop it away um, and that I was constantly in this sort of pursuit of like this fleeting moment of feeling good and then it dropping out and being like it'll last longer if I buy something better and thinking there was this mythical product that I was going to buy and it was probably going to be something really special and fancy and expensive that would just feel really indulgent and it was not going to be possible to be sad once I had that and that the high from buying that would would last that was that I mean that made I realize it makes no sense saying it now but that made perfect sense to me at that time in that place now what I have is very low self-esteem that I I still don't have the answer to if I did I probably wouldn't be talking about it would I let's be real I have very low self-esteem and I feel like I, basically what I feel like is that I'm not self-actualizing I'm not at the top of the pyramid I want to write for a living I'm working in marketing which I have huge issues with because I know how susceptible I am to marketing the whole purpose of marketing no matter what you're marketing and I work in an industry that is not fashion or beauty which is what I used to work in um, and it's much more business to business marketing a lot of the time as well so it's completely kind of different but there is the consumer side of it and it's this idea that you have to convince people that they're missing something in their life to want to fill that thing with your product basically the thing that I was succumbing to over and over again is what I am pumping out to other people. I'm hugely morally conflicted pretty much every day about that I work in marketing. I'm not sure it's the best place for me right now. We'll talk about my job later though, so yay, yay for that. God, I thought this video would be such a quick one. And that was why I was like, I'll do it while I'm getting ready. But all that about marketing aside, what I want to do is write. I want to write for a living. That is what I feel is the thing that fulfills me the most and yes I can get that fulfillment in a way out of just writing for myself but my like top pinnacle achievement is 
is the notion that I would like to be a full-time author who writes for a living. That to me would be self-actualizing, that would be fulfilling my potential, that would be top of pyramid. Now because I'm not doing that and I'm judging myself by this top pyramid need that I don't have and you know and I'm, I'm quite harsh in the way that I speak to myself about things which is something I'm trying to be slightly better about and I think it sounds so wishy-washy when people are like I'm really hard on myself. I feel like a lot of the time it sounds like they're asking for other people to give them a free pass and that is not what what I'm saying but it's that way that you say things to yourself you would never say to your friend and I'm trying to be better. I did cognitive behavioural therapy and a large part of that is about you know noticing these thoughts and feelings when they happen and addressing them and I don't think CBT massively worked for me at the time that I was doing it I don't think it was the right thing but somewhere in my subconscious I've obviously stored away parts of it because I'm trying to be better at noticing those thoughts I'm not always successful but I'm trying to be better at noticing those thoughts and noticing certain languages that I use to speak to myself that I would never say to anyone else and that I would be so angry if I thought anyone had said to anyone else. Basically, I feel like I'm failing in my self-actualization top of the pyramid. Then underneath that there is, so your second from the top is esteem which is your prestige and feeling of accomplishment and I, I am very low in self-esteem, I know that anyway. I suppose the thing is for me this sort of self-actualization like achieving my full potential. It's sort of like those two bits of the pyramid are mixed together for me. But under that there's belongingness and love needs. Now that's not a problem. I have a great group of friends. I am so grateful to my friends. I have really shitty friends for a long time in my life. I really, again, probably because of my own self-esteem, I was very attracted to people who treated me like shit and I chased those friendships. Even when I actually had the opportunity for other friendships that were healthier, this weird masochistic part of me would run after people that treated me like shit in both friendships and relationships and I am so thankful that I'm out of that and I have brilliant friends that I am just so grateful for on a daily basis. Now underneath that though, and this is my point of bringing this up, safety needs, so your security and safety. <sighs> now that I don't need to hold my phone I'm going to put some foundation on but I'm using this Dermacol one because I put it in my project pan and I barely use it and you only need a tiny bit of it so I think it's going to be a huge fail for a project pan item but you know we can only try our best. Anyway, safety and security, basically like financial security is your second from the bottom need and in a way I kind of have to say that in terms of like first need being shelter and warmth and food and rest linked to financial security because you pay for all of that you know it's not a case of you kind of can't have that without having financial well I suppose arguably you can because you could live paycheck to paycheck and be paying for that but it doesn't mean you have the financial security of a safety blanket which is really where my head's at with financial security so fair enough um you know financial security in terms of a nice savings account is a is a second. It still means that your first is intrinsically linked to you staying within a job that gives you the financial income you're used to having every month if you don't have that security of the safety blanket. You might be like what are you talking about because you said maybe literally one or two videos ago that you're not living hand to mouth and that you know you don't want to lose your job and you don't foresee it happening because lol this was pre-coronavirus. I said if I was to lose my job I'd be okay for a couple of months. It's both true and not true because to go back to comments somebody left me a comment that was about sinking funds and it wasn't a phrase that I'd ever heard before. Went off and looked into it and um, then basically had a small mental breakdown because I realised I have no savings. I have multiple sinking funds. So sinking funds basically, and I think it's just because I'd never heard this terminology before, I think I actually knew what this kind of forced me into knowing but I didn't have the terminology for it so I was able to not know it or not acknowledge that I knew it if that makes sense. Sinking funds are basically savings accounts that are for a purpose. So when you save for an expense that you know is coming up, so the example that somebody used and their kind of explanation of it when I went trolling on the internet 
was like if you know that your car tax is coming up that you pay annually you might have a sinking fund where you say that is it's going to cost you exactly 1200 pounds you can pay that out of one paycheck if you have a spare 1200 pounds out of one paycheck i mean i think for most people probably if you had to pay all your normal bills and then pay £1,200 of an expense, that's probably going to leave you quite a skint month if you can even afford to do so. So a sinking fund would be where you, between the time of setting up the sinking fund and the time of the expense, you figure out, you divide the expense by the amount of months that you have and you put aside a certain amount each month. So say you knew you paid this yearly, you might save £100 a month for a year so that it's been £100 a month out of your monthly income that you've saved for this rather than £1,200 out of one month as a bill. Does that make sense? And what that made me realise, not maybe exactly in the same way because it's not always a fixed amount that I have in my head, but basically all my savings accounts, um, whether it's like my actual savings account, which is my ISA, or my Monzo Pots, which are like little mini savings accounts. I love Monzo Pots, by the way, highly recommend Monzo Pot. They're all for an item. Yes, I have enough in my eyes that if I was to lose my job, I could live off of that money, but I would be so annoyed about it because to me that money is not there for me to live off of. That money is there for a couple of things that I have in my head that that money's for. You know, I have no savings that are savings for if something incomprehensible at the moment happens, such as if I lose my job, which is not incomprehensible at the moment. But you know, it was a month ago. It gave me a huge fright to kind of confront that because it was a bit like, I know I would begrudge taking money out of any of those pots to do something with that is not what is attributed to them. And I think that's what I was starting to get at in my check-ins in February, which was pre this comment when I still didn't have this terminology. Because I was saying when I have got things that I am allowed to pay for that are outside of my budget, such as health and safety things, such as the dental bill that I had to pay last month, I really begrudged that and I was kind of, I was talking about it in a way, that was actually what brought the comment on because I was talking about, I think next year maybe what I'll do is have like a pot at the start of the year that's got maybe a thousand pounds in it or something that is then there and is available for me if I have you know health bills or something like that not I've never really needed a thousand pounds for health in one year because thankfully we do have the NHS in this country although I am kind of quite aware that I should probably be in therapy but Having looked up therapists, they're between 80 and 100 pounds a session. Right now I don't have a spare 80 to 100 pounds to spend every week on a therapy session. Therapy is probably something I should set up a sinking fund for. I am using my MAC Studio, Studio Fix I think it is, pot concealer. I'll link all the products that I use down below. I feel like I've got the camera at an incredibly unflattering angle. You can see this like, whenever people leave me comments it's like, you need a bit more concealer and I'm like, no, no. That's not a dark circle, that's a physical shape of my eye. My eyes are physically like sunken in, so this that you can see here, it's not um, it's not something I can conceal away. It's just the physical, like, like I can rest my finger on it, if that makes sense. Like it sinks in, that's the shape. It's actually something that I was considering getting filters for as my birthday present to myself. But I'm currently in the middle of a spiral caused by coronavirus. It's making me just like, well, that's really shallow, isn't it? So I suppose it maybe isn't as bad as I think it is because if it was, would I even be bothering to put makeup on for this video or would I just be talking to you with no makeup on? Who knows? My parents started making a racket. So whilst they were doing what they had to do, I put on the NARS Radiant Creamy Concealer and RCMA No Colour Powder. So that's, that's all you missed in the getting ready with me side of the video. So the situation I'm in right now is that being allowed to work from home is not being offered to me by my work at the moment. I work in marketing. I could be doing my job, the majority of my job 
from home. I could at least be cutting down and be in office one day a week or something. My home is not optimised to work from home, it's not what I would choose to do. But in the middle of the coronavirus outbreak, kind of seems like I should be doing it because the government have literally issued guidelines to say if you can work from home, you should be working from home. So I personally feel I should be working from home. Not least of all also because I take public transport to and from work. And not in just one method of public transport, but two. I take a train and then I go on the subway. And I do that going to work and I do that coming home from work. So that's four different times that I have a chance of coming into contact with somebody with this virus that I could bring home and give to my grandparents. Now I live with my grandparents who are, as much as I don't like to think of them as being elderly, and they are very much fit and healthy and lucid etc. They're not, you don't look at them and think, oh you look like a frail elderly person. Um, but obviously they are physically of a certain age, that means that their systems, whether they are healthy or not, are more susceptible to this virus and um, I also have asthma which means that I'm more susceptible to damage from this virus so basically I should be working from home in my opinion I'm being treated at work by other people like I'm overreacting like I'm worried about nothing as though there's not a global pandemic going on and it's not being offered to me as an option to work from home which I find very very frustrating so where that leaves me is do I quit my job and I know that that's a really privileged position to be in because people are being made redundant left right and center I've seen the shitty news about the hotel that had just literally sent a message to its staff and said vacate the premises um, and you know hand your belongings back in and has left people homeless there was one guy saying he's going to have to sleep in a tent because he, he lived in the hotel he's from Spain so the G1 group in Glasgow has just literally let loads of staff go there's a cinema that's owned by Cineworld doing, done the same thing I realise the fact that I actually have a job at this point is it makes me luckier than a lot of people in this but I'm at that point where I'm like is having a job really worth it if I bring this thing home give it to my parents um, and lose one or potentially both of them. How am I meant to live with that? I'd rather live with being an unemployed person than live with that. And the other side of it is that if I don't voluntarily get my job up, I could potentially lose my job because you have no idea what impact this is going to make. Part of me is considering do I walk away from this job? The other part of me is like, I might not have a job anyway quite soon. What my point was with that, I don't have a savings account. So if I give up my job, I don't have money set aside to live off of. I have various sinking funds, some of which are for things that now seem so shallow in the wake of this, such as my one that's for my Lady Dior handbag and my one that's for my Chanel 2.55 because I do have Monzo pots for those bags. Not a lot of money in either of them, don't get me wrong. They're not going to tie me over if I take the money out of them, but they exist. I have those, but then I, my bigger savings accounts are for my house deposit and for bigger expenses and things I want to kind of achieve in the future. Right now, whilst I'm in this like uncertainty with my job, basically what it's doing is it's underlining that I'm in a position where I don't have the financial security, I don't have that second bit of the pyramid because if I take money out of my deposit savings account, which is by far my biggest savings account, I'm not financially stable in that I'm actually actively taking money out of an account that's saving up money in it to do point one of the pyramid, which is your food, shelter, warmth, etc. So I, I would be taken away from that. I have no savings account. Hadn't really thought about it in those terms until quite recently. Literally just as I confront it, this coronavirus happens. Now I have this uncertainty over my job security, therefore my income, therefore my financial security, um, because I have no other financial security. And it really is putting the, everything into perspective. And this is what I'm quite interested in hearing from you guys about, is how is this making you feel, particularly if you have had an issue with not necessarily spending addiction to the extent that I've described mine and my personal experience with it in terms of that like high or using it to patch other things but it would be brilliant if somebody who has had that same problematic addiction kind of spending rather than just being like I'm trying to get better with my money and um, 
could could kind of say to me this is just making everything seem so frivolous so i've always said that i'm aware that this problem of i'm trying to learn to budget and i'm trying to learn to use my money better and i'm trying to stop being so beholden to items it's not a problem i want to have because it's a problem that is definitely linked to my self-esteem issues so I'm kind of like, hey, if I didn't have the self-esteem issues, I wouldn't have the problem. But I'm aware that it's a privilege problem because it's not compounded by an excruciating amount of debt, which it would be if I was in um, a financially less privileged position than I'm in. And I have always acknowledged that, but it's, and Jesus, God, do not take this as any indication that I'm saying that wife beating is ever okay because it's not. Um, but it's one of those things that the, I can't believe I'm about to reference this. But if anyone's ever read the Outlander books or seen the TV show, in season one of the television show and quite early on in the first book, there is this scene where Jamie beats Claire and he thinks it's okay. And it's not okay and it's not historically accurate either because the Adam Smith Enlightenment period had, had started at this point and um, that wouldn't have been the case. So. Uh, can it then <laughs> historical inaccuracy guys I'm um, right let's not even go down that path because I could get on a complete tangent about the historical inaccuracies of that book and the fact that in the end <laughs> there's like a footnote where she talks about I think it's in an acknowledgments or something it must be where she talks about the fact that the last witch born in Scotland was like years before the start of the book and that that's not historically accurate and you know she's talking to her husband about it and she's really worried and he's like you've got people time traveling through stones like why are you worried about this and I'm like oh pal there's so much wrong with your books that's not the only thing you should be worried about but anyway there is this line in the book and it stayed with me because it really angered me and I, th I think it might actually be before he beats her when he's trying to make her understand why it's okay that he's about to hit her I can't even talk about it. You understand me, you say, and I believe it, but there's a difference between understanding something with your mind and really knowing it deep down. Then it goes on to say, I can tell you from my own experience that a good hiding makes you consider things in a more serious light. I can't, I can't even, I can't actually go down this road right now. So I am not under any circumstances quoting this line because I agree with his um, methods of making her understand something really deep down but the line itself that difference between understanding something in an academic sense with like your with your brain basically I suppose is what I'm trying to get at is that I have in an academic sense acknowledged the privilege of the position that I'm in and I, I'm not trying to be super harsh on myself because you know we are literally facing this global pandemic that is it's unprecedented as much as I'm sure we're all so sick of hearing the word unprecedented. This kind of situation was just inconceivable to me outside of a book or a film not that long ago. I can't really, I'm not going to make myself apologise for not considering it in this light before or for not truly understanding it in this light. It's one of those ones, it's very easy to sit and say, you know, best things in life are free and what really matters in life is that you have people around you and food on your table and your health is your wealth and all those things it's not until you seriously get them taken away from you I think that you can or the threat of them being taken away from you and um, that you really can in your bones feel how lucky you've been to have those things. The privilege of being able to budget my £250 a month to live off of and being able to have spent hours of my life last month, not even last month, like up till a few weeks ago, going over and over in my head what I was going to do about my hairdresser that I couldn't afford anymore. Just all of those things now suddenly seem so shallow. I couldn't be less interested in shopping at the moment. I feel so threatened. I feel like my complete existence as I have understood it up till now has been really threatened and it's been very interesting because I for a very long time was very calm about this. I say very long time. 
it's not really been a very long time, let's be real, but I was very calm about it and I read this piece in the cut. I emailed this to myself because I thought I kind of want to come back to this. Do you ever email yourself stuff because you know you want to come back to it but you know you'll close the tab? It was this article on thecut.com was posted on March 17th and it is Addiction in Isolation adjusting to video chat 12 step meetings. Now it's somebody who is recovering from being an alcoholic and they're talking about AA meetings now taking place over the phone and stuff but there was this line in it that just stuck out to me that was it turns out alcoholics are very adaptable in times of uncertainty when fear and negative emotions are running high. This is not unfamiliar territory for us, ours is a culture of life on life's terms. The writer is Michael Rovner. Then I saw another thing as well. It was just some meme that was on Facebook that was saying like all the people that I know with anxiety are coping really well with coronavirus because we've all already considered the worst case scenario so many times and that was true for quite a while. I was quite calm and I was just like yep yeah, right this is what we need to do. If this thing gets here and it goes the way of Italy this is the course of action. I was weirdly calm about it. I really really was and I feel like this sort of panic has only actually crept in in the last few days because I'm going to start in my eyes and I'm going to put down this Chanel Rouge Noir illusion d'ombre as a base put it on with my fingers i actually i kind of wonder i work again it was for a small private business but it was a person starting their own fashion label so i was doing that job when i started my beauty no buy in 2018 i was doing it for the whole the whole year of that and i wonder just in terms of what i'm saying about marketing and that having to convince somebody that they are missing something that your product is going to fill i wonder if i literally only made it a beauty no buy to start with which I still think was the right thing to do I think it's what I can mentally cope with but I wonder if part of what my brain did there was deliberately not consider a wider no buy to include fashion because I don't think I could have made my peace with the job that I was doing when I was trying to convince people that they needed these items of clothing that they didn't need whilst me myself was trying to rail against that in my personal life. Interesting thought. Oh, Christ, let me just go and clean that up. My battery needed charge so whilst I was cleaning up uh, that eyeshadow that I put on the side of my nose I did my eyebrows. I used the Benefit Brow shade number three and the Benefit Ready Set Brow. My eyebrows are a bit of a mess because they really need done but given that I'm really angry about the fact I'm being made to travel into work and back through the week I can't really spend my weekend being like I'm going to go get somebody to give me skin to skin contact whilst they do my eyebrows can I really like that would be hypocritical. I am going to use this Dior Quint and um, you can't get it anymore it's the shade 756 Golden Shock it was from a Christmas collection a little while ago so this is what it looks like it's these kind of purpley tones. So first off I'm going into this one. Basically I feel like a bad feminist. I feel like I'm failing at being a feminist by not demanding more from my boss at work. But then in the effort of trying to be more gentle with myself and speak to myself how I'd speak to a friend, like I don't think I'd ever, and again this is the same thing of not appreciating something that you have because you don't realise you have it, um, but I don't think I'd really realised how much of a part of my feminism is me enjoying my financial independence. That's partly why I don't want to make a fuss at work because I'm a bit like if there's redundancies coming I don't want to talk myself into being in the first wave of them because I made a fuss. Do you know what I mean? It's one of those ones I feel like I'm being a bad feminist by not making a fuss but I'm also like not being financially independent is such a horrible concept. And then that leads into sort of self-loathing and self-shaming the fact that you know my beauty collection is worth whatever it's worth that was actually going to be today's video was going to be my 2020 beauty beauty resolutions um, and then I'm going to do a beauty inventory as well but that might be a separate video to the resolutions video because it's probably quite a long concept but whatever that's going to be worth when I total it all up that could have been a financial security blanket that would mean 
that right now the position that I'm in wouldn't be quite so fraught in terms of the feminist aspect of wanting to be financially independent and not reliant. It's a key pillar for me is never being in a relationship where you're reliant on the other person. Um, I think I've damaged myself in my past relationship financially by going so far the other way that he was reliant on me all the time um, and I saw this, I kind of in my head I think made this into like a, oh I've like aced the feminism test because I'm certainly not borrowing any money from you and you now owe me money which I obviously never got back. The idea of not being independent really stresses me out. It stresses me out but then it's also like it's not worth what I'd be facing if I took this virus home and carried it home to my parents so is it really worth having a job just to be financially independent? It's such a myriad of thoughts. Basically would be less of a situation and less of a worry and less of a however many minutes long this video has been so far myriad of me you know talking about this in circles if I had the financial security blanket of money stashed away that could support me for a few months without actually being money that I'm taking out of being money that is already for something else. I hope that made sense. That seemed like a very complicated sentence that I just said. But it's that it's that guilt thing again and I think the guilt and the, the way that I speak to myself is not conductive to my self-esteem which is I think at the root of why I've been buying things in the first place. Does that make sense? It's this kind of circle. So I think one of the ways that I can try and stop that circle, as well as obviously I have stopped my spending, is by stopping and being aware of the language that I'm using to myself and the way that I'm speaking to myself and just trying to be a bit more gentle with myself and not give in to sort of shame and guilt all the time which are two of my main emotions at all times. I'm very much a self-punishing person and very much somebody who's like well you've made your bed so you can lie in it even when I'm sort of on this trajectory of trying to change these behaviours and get out of it. Does that make sense? I'm really sorry this video is not coherent at all but to kind of roll back round I'm going to go into this shade here and use it all over my lid. If you have had issues with spending, is spending as a self-soothing mechanism appealing to you in the middle of a global pandemic or is it doing what it's doing for me which is making it seem you know like really putting it into perspective how ridiculous wanting and coveting shoes or whatever it is is in the grand scheme of things but at the same time to an extent there's nothing wrong with really realizing that but it's very easy for things that women like and I have noticed as well in terms of these sort of novice and stuff mainly women that are doing them it's very easy to find ways that shame women for liking shallow things like fashion and beauty and it's one of those things men could go on and know by quite easily because men are not judged for their appearance we are told from this young age through the systematic way that women are treated that our appearance is important. Like we're more likely to get a better job if we wear makeup, we're more likely to get higher pay if we wear makeup, but we're still never gonna get the job or the pay that's available to the man not wearing any makeup, but women with makeup, you know, well presented, slim. It's that thing that like, if you're overweight, it's not just a physical defunct in you, it's a mental, shortcoming it's seen as it's interpreted as being you know lazy slovenly unable to take care of oneself undisciplined if a woman is overweight in a way that it's not interpreted by employers in the same way if a man is overweight we are told we have ingrained into us that our appearance that our appearance is important then we are told that the things that we are concerned about with fashion and beauty are shallow and I don't see any men on here giving up buying their football season tickets that cost a fortune because, you know, they've been to too many football games in their lifetime. And I know they're not exactly the same thing, but generally men's hobbies do not carry the sort of societal shaming and the sort of shallowness that we attribute. Just had to change camera because my battery ran out in the other camera again, so this might look different, but... That is why. But anyway, I was I was kind of gearing up for a proper ranty thing anyway, so maybe just as well the camera went out. 
But basically, what my point was, I did put on my mascara. So NARS Climax Mascara, which I really like. But basically what my point is, that it's very easy for women to be shamed over the things that they like and over their hobbies in a way that it's not so easy to shame men for. So when I succumb into this sort of shame and guilt, you know, again, is it me feeling as feminist? So in terms of the fact that I don't feel any need to shop and I'm instead in this kind of place again where I can feel myself using really acidic language and berating myself my shortcomings and the things that I failed on to mean that I'm not sitting with the money that I've spent on shallow things like makeup and clothing over the years, not sitting with that as a safety blanket and that I've created this because I'm, you know, I'm so shallow and so ridiculous as a person and whatever. And I'm just like, well, is that just internalised misogyny? Like, is this not, is this having no desire to shop? actually a positive thing or not? Is it extreme internalised misogyny? I don't know because what I found interesting, the whole reason this all sort of kicked off my head is that Hannah Louise Poston, who one of you recommended to me again in the comments, I don't watch my videos by the way, just read the comments, that's where it all, where the good stuff is. She went on a no by year akin to the one that I'm doing this year for everything, like a blank no by year of everything um, in the same year that I went on my first year of my beauty no buy so this is my third year of my beauty no buy so um, 2018. We seem to have very very similar kind of when she talks about you know a sort of dissatisfaction with her life it resonates with me in terms of the sort of dissatisfaction with what I'm achieving with my life um, and the way that she shopped to you know this idea that she could buy things and that that would change the by acting like she had the sort of social economic status to spend the money that she was spending. It was like she could almost sort of convince herself she'd achieved that by sort of aping that through, you know, acquiring things. Again, I just want to underline, like, I'm not in huge amounts of debt and things, so I realise I have um, a sort of economic privilege in that, but it's the same... It was, it was shopping to fill the same hole, in a sense. Where she is now is obviously she did her full no buy for a year and then I watched a video, I had been absolutely binging her back catalogue last year because she had savings for what I think was kind of like the first time in her life. She was able to move herself and her boyfriend to a, a new home, you know, in a, in a way that they couldn't because I don't really know how it works, but it's something to do with leases and things like that. But basically she had a savings account um, that had money in it for the first time ever. And she said that dealing with this, this kind of virus situation, she's not given in to her urges, but that her old urges had sort of reared their heads and she wanted to shop again. And she was talking about as well, her shopping went out of control following uh, Donald Trump being voted in as president and how, you know, this is in a way a similar situation that she wanted to self-soothe via shopping with whereas I feel like we've had this same sort of attraction to items and what we think they can promise us in our lives and gone through a similar um you know kind of I don't think she's ever maybe well I think she has said addiction I don't want to put words in her mouth um, and I know she is she said as well in one of her videos that she doesn't really deal with like anxiety and depression past what is a kind of normal human dip to experience and that's you know that's obviously her mental health to comment on um so obviously I've got more of a yes I was clinically depressed kind of background that drove my shopping addiction but a lot of the emotional journey that she talks about with shopping is, is similar to my emotional journey when I shop but we've just had such very different reactions to this where it's causing her want to shop and want to self-soothe via shopping to rear whereas for me it's like god I can't think of anything that would be more shallow or more indicative that you are part of this capitalist consumer culture um, that you should have the knowledge to be better than and have the education to be better than because you've got you've had the privilege of you know private education and a uh, further education and it's you know it's this berating myself and I'm, I'm a bit like actually would it be a healthier sign 
mentally if I wanted to shop right now. I don't know, but let me know where you are if you've dealt with sort of problematic spending um, and how it's how you feel at the moment in terms of with what's going on in the world, what are your impulses and urges at the moment? Do you want to shop or do you not want to shop? What do you think the sort of wider picture of that is? Because I'm just so fascinated by the fact that she and I have had very similar journeys and have, and it's not just different, I obviously I cannot speak um, on Hannah's behalf, but like viscerally different, in my opinion, reactions to this and that I couldn't I like I just physically couldn't think of anything that would seem more shallow or ridiculous than to want to shop right now and it's not it's not a small thing it's this overwhelming feeling of how stupid shopping is when this is going on in the world because I want to do this really dark lip I'm not sure how much cheek I'm going to need so I'm going to do the lip first so I am going to use MAC Night Moth lip liner and I'm going to go sharpen it actually before I use it. Couldn't find a sharpener so just went with it. So there's a bit of MAC Night Moth on my lips. Um, I'm then going to use NARS Audacious Lipstick in the shade Live which is this like beautiful very dark deep lip. I'm going to stamp from the bullet rather than swipe. Just like that and then I'm going to start rubbing my lips together a la Mary Greenwell's technique. The key issue, I've said this a million times with these lipsticks, is just that they move around so much. Um, so I'm going to use a lip brush to kind of top it up. I feel like it looks a bit patchy in the monitor, but it doesn't in real life. This is the problem with Get Ready With Me, is like the way that I have it set up, I'm just looking in that little tiny screen there and being like, that doesn't look quite right there, but it looks absolutely fine in a real mirror. Okay, so lip is on. I feel like I look a bit more myself now with lipstick on. And the next thing I'm going to do is do my cheeks. And I really wanted to use this highlighter. So this is from the Colourpop Midnight Masquerade collection that came out last year. Um, and it's the, the Meg highlighter. It's called Big Tough Girl. Um, I feel like Meg was very instrumental to my feminism as a child, just since we've chatted feminism today. But it is a kind of lilac -y shade and I haven't actually used it as a highlighter yet, so I kind of thought I'm only really putting makeup on to talk to you guys in this video. I'm not, obviously, I'm not going anywhere today, so let's just have a, have a play with it. This was really what sparked everything that else that I was going to use today was that I decided I was going to use this highlight. Even though I've used that redness thing, I feel like I've got cheeks not helped, as I said, by the kind of sunken eyes. That means my cheeks sort of stick out more than they would if my eyes didn't go inwards. Do you ever just feel like you've spent far too much time in your life analysing your face? Me either. So it's not a thing. Okay, I kind of pulled out two blushes because I thought I'd do everything else and see how I felt. And I pulled out MAC Stubborn, which is a sort of plummy colour and then it also pulled out Tenderling again by MAC. We've had quite a MAC heavy. Oh no we haven't really. Just I think because I've just said MAC lip pencil and then this as well it's kind of felt like there's more MAC than there there was. So Tenderling versus Stubborn. I feel like I might go in with Tenderling first because I feel like I could top up with Stubborn if I feel like Tenderling isn't enough whereas if I go in with this first it's it's there and that's it because I wasn't sure if I'd want like a cheek as well or if I just want something to kind of give some life which Tenderling is quite good for. I feel like I had something else I wanted to discuss in this video. I can't remember and I feel like I have kind of probably discussed more than enough. God knows how I'm getting this edited down. Multiple hours of footage. The sky has changed outside in the time we have been chatting. I feel like that's enough. I feel like my face is alive. Yes, I feel Tenderling was the right choice. Quick, my bra strap up. Does anyone know actually? Is anyone really short like me and feel like you just spend half your life pulling your bra straps up? Um, do you have a solution? Are there any bras for short people with huge chests out there? Small back, huge chest, small like shoulder to bra ratio? Is that the right phrase? Probably not. Thank you very much for watching this exceptionally long rambly video. I will be back with another video next week so 
please stay at home if you can and you're not being forced into work. Look after one another and stay safe. Bye.